Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Vocal with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are into our final instalment of Magical October, and I'm thrilled to have with me this time Mara Starling, who was born in North Wales, raised on the Isle of Anglesey, and who is a native Welsh speaker. She's a transgender woman who's been practicing witchcraft from a very young age, and her witchcraft videos on TikTok have more than a million views. She's a celebrant and a tarot reader, and she also runs moot gatherings and open rituals. And she was featured in the BBC Wales documentary series, Young, Welsh and Pretty Religious. So we're going to be chatting about how her knowledge of Welsh folklore informs her practice, how mythology and folklore in general work in Wales. And we'll also be having a chat about things like Celtic deities and how you don't necessarily always want to roll them together. Enjoy. Welcome to Fabulous Folklore. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it, uh, it is honestly, I've been trying so hard not to find girl. Um, obviously, for um, Magical October, I've been talking to magical practitioners of various descriptions of how they kind of use folklore and history around witchcraft to inform their practice. And I love the fact that literally all of you do. So that's that's really nice. But before we kick off, I'll start with the same question I've started with everyone else, and that's how would you define witchcraft to a non-practitioner? Oh, well, I always say that and it might sound like a boring answer compared to what some people might tell you about witchcraft being all, you know, sparkles of light and magic and healing and all this. But I've always found that the best way to describe witchcraft is that witchcraft is inherently all about relationship. So whether that is relationship with the land, relationship with the spirits of that land, or relationships with the people around you. And I often, when I when I describe it like that, I get odd looks because like, what do you mean it's all about relationship? And I'm like, well, that's what we do. It's all about the relationship that you have with various aspects of um, your life and the things around you, the things that surround you. It's about acknowledging that the world around you is inherently alive and inspirited and that our relationship with all of those entities and beings that are very much alive are very beneficial. Like it's beneficial to have a good standing relationship, not just because it makes you a powerful witch or anything like this, but just because in general, it makes your life much easier. So for example, being in relationship with the land is all about understanding how the land moves and how the cycles of say the seasons alters the land around you. It's about getting to know the land on an intimate level, not just romanticizing this idea of, you know, oh, the land is beautiful and poetic and it, it is all of that. Yes, it's very, especially here in Wales, like, you know, you look out the window and you see the mist drawing in from the mountains and you're like, oh my gosh, my heart. But it's also about understanding what is going on in your backyard as well, being in that right relationship where you know what's going on and you're aware of the very subtle changes and such to the point where you can walk outside and you can just feel something on the wind and you're like, oh, something's not right. Something's off today. And it's those little things. And then also relationship with the people around you, because historically witchcraft and magic, I should say, not witchcraft, but magic in essence has long been a trade. You know, it was a, a way for people to uh, make a living in a lot of ways. People traded their magical skills for things like food and money and clothes. And so being in relationship with the people around you was important because you couldn't help them on a magical level level unless you knew them as people um, and I think sometimes relationship is something that is often I suppose tossed aside in modern witchcraft in favor of the aesthetics and the beauty and the personal development and spiritual growth that comes with it but I think to truly walk the path of witchcraft is to be in relationship in various different ways and I hope that makes some semblance of sense <laughs> yes it does and I think that's what's really interesting. So I know Una mentioned the service profession element of, of witchcraft. And I think, yeah, everybody sort of had that idea of connecting with where you are, because I think there is that tendency. And I think um, Emma talked about this, you know, that you romanticize like the old ancient wood and this, and then you kind of go and it's full of dog walkers <laughs> and rubbish and people hanging up like dog poo bags and things. And it's not really as cool anymore. And it's like, well, why is that more magical than like your local neighborhood and so on and things like that? Exactly. Yes. And it's all about, I suppose, getting to know um, being 
in relationship with what's on your backyard was really important to me specifically because I came into witchcraft via um, I, I will admit, via spiritualist communities, first and foremost. So when I first started um, on my path, I didn't know much about witchcraft in the broader sense. And I was a teenager at the time. And so the first things I found were like spiritualist churches and spiritualist groups and mediumship groups and such. And so that aspect of spirituality is very focused on uh, personal development and self-growth, which was beneficial to me at the time because I was in a very low place. I didn't really like myself very much. So it was good to get, you know, my relationship with myself to a level where I actually accepted myself and was feeling worthy enough to be in this world but once I'd kind of established myself in that place and I was comfortable with these spiritual people that I was around I started noticing that they drew their inspiration of their spiritual practice from sources that were far far away across the seas so they were looking mostly to things like eastern practices and I remember having a moment when I was about 16 17 where I sat with myself and I thought do we not have you know, maybe things that are closer to home that we can tap into rather than, you know, a, a basically just appropriating aspects of cultures that are far away and probably um, bastardizing them and diminishing them from their original context. Do we not have things that I can connect to that are right here on my doorstep that are part of the culture in which I was raised in? And being in relationship with the land for me was also about that, about acknowledging my own culture and the way in which the people of here have interacted with the land for so long because so many of our stories and our myths and our legends are rooted in locality. I often say to American audiences because I have my 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 book is published through an American company, so I have a lot of American friends and followers and such. And so I often say to them when they tell stories, um, there's this aspect of their storytelling which is very like, oh, in a land far away a long, long time ago. Whereas when I think of the stories of my people and my land, it's like, oh no, um, a story that happened down the road over there by that rock and not that long ago because my great grandmother remembers it. And there's this feeling of closeness. And I think that was important to me was acknowledging that once you're in right relationship with the land that isn't based in romanticism, you begin to open up relationship to other aspects of your life as well, to the people around you, to your ancestors. There's just, it opens up so many doors, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way of, of looking at it. Um, but I think that I was wondering, um, with the idea of like witchcraft versus magic, because I know you've got a, a different approach to this, do you think it's important for people to actually define for themselves what witchcraft is before they get started and what a witch is? Or do you think it's better that people just kind of follow their curiosity and find their own way into it? Oh, definitely. I think it's probably best to explore and find your way first. Um, I know for me, things kind of opened up naturally. Um, and that is my only experience, the only context that I can think about witchcraft within, because I didn't come into this with an interest in a very specific tradition or practice or anything like that. It kind of opened up for me. I always tell the story when people ask how I got into witchcraft, where I um, think back to how my grandmother, my nine, um, we called her nine Mumu, which translates to grandmother Mumu, because she lived on a farm with a bunch of cows. She was a really magical person. And I was a really odd child, so I didn't have that many friends as a child, and I struggled. I'm, I'm neurodivergent, so I, like, I struggled with making friends. I struggled with these unspoken rules that society seemed to have that I couldn't understand. And I was a very sad child because of that. And the times I felt most at peace with who I was was when I was around Nine Mumu, who was uh, very magical. She used to read tea leaves for people. She used to read the crystal ball. I don't think she'd identify as a witch. I think if you called her a witch, she'd probably slap you. Um, but she very much did things that a lot of people today might associate with witchcraft. And so I felt this closeness to her and I wanted to be near her all the time. But she died when I was quite young as well. And when she died, I wanted to to just be as close to her as possible. And, and there was this feeling of like, even though she's dead, she's still here because she still influences the way that I see the world. 
And I remember once I went to a charity shop not long after her death with my mother and I found a book called Spells for Teenage Witches. And it's it's a lovely little book. I still have it over there. It's a bit of a silly, like little, you know, dinky book. But it was my first steps into this. And through that book, I remember when I bought it, my mother then turned to me and said, oh, do you remember that teacher who used to come in and teach you art at primary school? she's a witch. And I'd go, no way. Oh my God. So I went down to her little cottage. She lived in a, she was the stereotypical kind of witch. She lived on the outskirts of the village, across a little bridge. You had to walk up this like little narrow country road to get to her house. And then her house was covered in these like green men, ornamental statues. She had broomsticks like uh, lent up against the walls and she had this massive fireplace. And I remember knocking on her door and she was a really intimidating character. And I asked her, like, can you teach me everything that you know? And she very, like, intimidatingly looked down at me and she went, I suppose. And she did. She took me under her wing and she taught me so much. Um, and all of that happened, like, naturally. It was almost like things just opened up as I started traversing down this. And I never really knew what to call myself because here in Wales, we have like a very strange relationship with witches and witchcraft when we look into our history. And so the word for witch in Welsh is gurach. That's the word that you'll mostly find in dictionaries and such. And that never felt right to me. So though I was calling myself a witch in English, when I spoke my native language, I never knew what to call myself until eventually I came across some terms that were like rooted in the history of folk magic and such from here. Um, so I call myself a Suinreich nowadays. And that label came to me um, very naturally. It just kind of appeared one day and it felt right finally. And I've got odd, odd opinions probably compared to most when it comes to labels and such, because being a you know trans person, being someone who's neurodivergent, I've found that labels can sometimes be freeing rather than restrictive. A lot of people see labels as purely restrictive, but for me, finding labels like neurodivergent and trans and witch and suinraig, these were labels that gave me a sense of, I'm not alone. I actually am not a broken thing in this world. There is a word for what I am, and there are other people that are this. So I'm not this broken thing that doesn't belong in the world that shouldn't exist. So finding those labels were really freeing for me. Um, but that was my personal experience. And I know that some people might have the opposite, where putting a label on themselves might feel like they're restricting what they are. So I always tell people not to worry. And I think there's a huge obsession right now in witchcraft with like, what kind of witch are you? Are you a green witch? Are you a cosmic witch? Are you a lunar witch? And all this. And I get rather tired of it because it, it gets a bit much, doesn't it? And often I get a bit weirded out because of things like, well, I'm a green witch because I work with herbs. And I'm like, which witch doesn't work with herbs? I, I get a bit lost on that one sometimes. Um, but I suppose if it gives you a sense of power and freedom, then good but you don't need it either. You can just find your way and develop your practice as someone who is just building relationship, just someone who is attempting to build relationship on a deeper visceral level. And I think I was lucky that I had that experience of just letting life unfold in front of me. Yeah, yeah. Because I was really interested to read in your book about the difference between the witch trials in England and Wales. And... I I was, I was I think it's quite interesting as well because obviously the the Welsh concept of of the fairies and and so on is a lot more similar to the the Northumbrian one, but I, I quite like the fact that you've got I don't know how do I put it um almost like the English like completely ruin things if that makes sense as as we often do let's be honest um so while obviously I recommend that people get your book um, and read it themselves how would you sum up that difference um, in the witch trials um, between England and Wales? Yeah I think um, I, I always try and kind of explain this and it's a difficult one to explain because you have to try and explain it in English which is hard enough as it is because um, if you don't have the nuance of the Welsh language in there it's harder but to kind of sum it up which is witches in Wales were an odd thing. They they didn't really fit into the same mould and the same standard as the English conception of the witch. And that can be proven by looking at the history of the witch trials, because when the witch trials did start to make their way slowly into Wales, the Welsh were a bit like, what's that? 
I don't know what that is. That doesn't make sense to me. So much so that we didn't even have a word for which when it came to the trials. You will see that if you look into the actual um, Great Sessions court records, uh, which is really good. We have like really good record of what was going on in the courts at that time during Wales, uh, during the witch trials in Wales. And you can see the kind of the little records that we have of what people are being accused of, even if they're written in Welsh, the word that they will use to describe what they're being accused of are things like wits or witch or witchcraft, which is like a Welshification of the English words witch and witchcraft. So even though we have words like grach, like suinid, like suinraig, to denote a magical practitioner, or grach tends to denote like hag or um, a malicious kind of image of an older woman, even though we have those terms, they never used them. They borrowed English terms because it was such an unfamiliar concept to them. And the best person to look into, or the best two people I would say to look into when it comes to um, the witch trials and uh, kind of perceptions of witchcraft and magic in Wales are Richard Sudgett and Lisa Tallis. So both of their works are fantastic when it comes to Welsh um, perceptions of witchcraft, demonology and magic in general. And Richard Sudgett puts it very nicely in his A History of Witchcraft and Magic in Wales. It's that when you look at the amount of witch trials that happened in England versus the amount that happened in Wales, you can see a clear disparity between what was going on in both nations. But academics have kind of been scratching their heads for decades now trying to figure out like why why is this going on and there are so many theories about what it is and you know most people have their favorite theory as to which academic they tend to follow but we won't know for sure ever we won't ever know for sure um the main theories nowadays tend to focus on things like um for example there's one theory that states that, well, during the same period where the witch trials were going wild in England and not in Wales, we had a lot of trials directed towards thieves. So it might just be the case that the Welsh were more concerned about their cheese and their sheep than they were about witchcraft at the time. Um, some people have put forward that maybe the belief in fairies might have had an influence on it, because if you had a sudden bout of misfortune, rather than um, saying that it was Shirley down the road who's cast a curse on you, you were more likely to say, oh, it's the fairies that have done this. Um, but that theory is kind of like most people don't like it because it's rooted in a belief in fairies. And then you have to accept that people believed in fairies. And then my personal favourite theory is just simply that we didn't have the perception of the witch in that very satanic English kind of concept because we were so very used to the idea of magical practitioners. You know, the idea of cunning folk and such is found across all of um, like England, Scotland, Wales, everywhere. But here in Wales, it seems that magic was just constantly part of everyday life. And so the idea that uh, magic could harm was like, well, duh, obvious, but it can also help. And therefore, we don't really care about trying to persecute them. And the main proof I think I have for this is that we had entire tracts that were created basically propaganda manuals that were created around the 17th century to try and convince the Welsh, like, hey, you should stop believing in magic and stop going to those magical practitioners. They're bad. So the Welsh were so like used to going to these people and seeing them as just normal help that we just didn't have that conception of, well, this is actually evil and wicked and vile. So yeah, it's a complicated subject and there's so many different theories as to why we differed so much. There were more witch trials per county in England, per individual county, than there were in the entirety of Wales. And when we look at the amount of people that were executed, it was only a handful of people that were executed in Wales compared to the like 500 odd in England. And it is insane when you think of it in that regard. But nobody really knows why. It's just various theories. And I like to just think it's just because we're inherently a magical bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Do you think then people would have had a different attitude to like magic more in a more widespread way if people had followed the Welsh concept of life just being a bit more magical than the English one, which obviously is quite poor faced and rather dull? <laughs> I like to think so. When we look at things like folk magic historically, they were always quite syncretic and such. And it's almost odd. Like when I talk to people about traditional charms and such, and I'd start reciting some of these traditional charms that we have recorded. 
And there's so many Christian elements in there, which showcases to us that for so long, there was this blend of Christianity and magic. And there is this belief nowadays that, you know, that because of the rise of technological and scientific advancements, that that's why we're moving away from magic. But if anything, I think we need magic more than ever now, because it's so easy to see the world as this dull, black and white, grey, bleak place. It's so easy to become kind of depressed when looking at the way in which our governments and such are doing their stuff. And nobody really has religion to fall back on anymore. Um, and so I think enchantment, so the power of things like story and folktale and magic and myth, they're needed more than ever nowadays. And I think that would be easier if the Welsh conception of magic was kind of more the, the, the norm, I suppose, if it was that we embraced it in the way the Welsh did. And I think it's just apparent how much like we tend to kind of embrace our magical cultural traditions nowadays there are some people who argue that there is this idea of um I don't know, this backwards thinking that the welsh culture is inherently more magical but even here in wales like i will argue that it is a part of our inherent culture because i grew up within it and i know that people kind of have this reverence for the magic of the culture in itself so we're very proud of our myths we're very proud of our stories to the point where schools have murals of the stories on the walls and you know i never really got taught biblical stories in school but i was taught the mabinogi in primary school and i think that to me proves that there is this element of that we do embrace it a bit more and it would have been nice if that was more widespread and i think it's becoming that now i think it's why so many people are coming to to things like witchcraft because there is this demand for a bit more enchantment in life maybe a bit more color <laughs> yeah i know i was really uh envious when una said that the same thing happened on shetland that people went around telling these folk tales and keeping the folk stories alive and things and i think the closest we had to that in obviously sort of tyneside was you would generally learn about coal mining at some point because how stereotypical but we did, we did used to get to learn about things like St Cuthbert, who mm. is quite a badass, who then essentially goes and lives on an island, banishes demons and talks to birds. So you're kind of like, he's quite cool. That, mm. And that was a that was a Church of England school where we did that. So that was quite interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. More enchantment would be nice. <laughs> and speaking of the idea of maybe a backwards view that people might have, which would could be wholly undeserved as well, what sort of myths of sort of misconceptions about witches more widely would you just love to see the back of and I know there was the discourse about um Mabon and all that kind of thing um back in the autumn but what other sort of myths or misconceptions just more generally would you love to get rid of oh gosh that's a tough one um because I'm I'm quite a strange thing and I quite love the uh the more sinister aspect of witch folklore. I quite like it. Um, I think there is an essence of witches that needs to be a bit monstrous and needs to be a bit, you know, callous and wicked because it speaks to something. And it's something I wrote about in my book. It's this whole, like, there is this pull towards modern witchcraft um, that kind of attracts those who feel like minorities or like they are oppressed in this world right now. There is this draw that witchcraft has for us. And I'm speaking, you know, again, as somebody who's trans and neurodivergent, it was a pull for me as well, that feeling of, well, this world is not built for me. And if anything, this world wants someone like me dead in, in an instant. There is so many, uh, there are so many like tropes out there in the world that make you feel like you shouldn't belong um, when you are a minority or you're looked down upon within society. And something like witchcraft is kind of like an invitation, like, you know, come over this side, come, come to the dark side. You know, you might not be able to pull the strings on a more kind of official level, but you might be able to do some magic towards it. And I like that. I like that. And it's a very modern take on it. It's a very modern understanding of it. But I quite like that it can offer that empowerment. But at the same time, it's kind of, I, I would like to eradicate the idea that we are living in some fantasy world. You know, there is this I was speaking recently to a Welsh language um, reporter who was doing a news article about um, Norse Galangeyav, our kind of traditional Halloween. And 
she was saying to me that, oh gosh, there's this idea that um, witchcraft and magic is like just non-existent or that it's inherently sinister. What do you think about that? And I remember turning to her and I said, you, you know, here in Wales, the, I only get one of two responses from people when I say I'm a witch. And it's either that people think that I'm this wicked satanic thing that is cursing everyone at every chance I get, or they turn around and they say that I watch a little bit too much Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter and I'm stuck in a fantasy world. And honestly, it is that one that offends me more than people thinking that I'm wicked. I'm like, if you want to think I'm going to put a curse on you, I'm not going to stop you. I spent my life being fearful of being out in, in the real world. So if you want to fear me now, that's fine. <laughs> I don't care. Um, but at the same time, like the 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 idea that it's just being stuck in a fantasy world. That one tends to bug me, especially because I'm not a big fan of Lord of the Rings. So that one is just like, how dare they? Um, so yeah, it's it's an odd one. Uh, one myth that I think needs to be eradicated is that we are all completely woo-woo cuckoo. And that's something that's developing nowadays, is this idea that, you know, that witches are inherently the people who are like, oh gosh, you've just caught the cold. That's fine. Shove a piece of smoky quartz up your hoo-ha and you'll be fine in no time. And I think there are, there are more of us now that are kind of putting forward the idea that we're a bit more grounded than that. And our beliefs are just a regular part of our lives. Uh, we might do things that some people consider odd, but, you know, so do various other groups of people. Um, other than that, we're just ordinary people expressing ourselves within the confines of our beliefs. And I will say that if if I were to, uh, so because I operate within the pagan community more predominantly, um, I don't necessarily care much what the outside world tends to think of us i'm like if they want to know they can come and you know come join an open ritual or something see what we do get involved read a book or two um but when it comes from inside the community itself there's a few things that like bug me more so recently coming from within the pagan community than from without out so for example, lately there's been this huge push towards the idea that if you express yourself in a certain way, you are less serious of a witch. Like, you know, if you like to dress in cloaks and you like to wear ritual attire, then you're less serious than the people who turn up in jeans and t-shirts. And I'm like, but I want to have fun. Why can't I be a serious witch and like a good velvet cloak every now and then, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's an odd one. Yeah, I think the I th I know I said this before. Uh, we we started last started recording. The thing that um I'd love to get rid of just in in that community is this complete and utter lack of research. And that's why mm. I was so pleased that your book has footnotes, because I think that a lot of books just repeat what the previous ones that were like way back to the seventies. Who their research methodology they may not have had one. So it's kind of they fill in the blanks with what they didn't know with what sounded good, and you think well that might be fine but now people are sort of are, are taking that as as fact and I know I was uh, I've been doing some research for a talk I'm doing on Monday about the folklore of guising and the number of websites who keep openly repeating what the Celts believed and practiced and I'm like they didn't write things down and which Celts which Celts do you mean um and it's just because people just repeat something over and over so I like the fact that your stuff has like citations and I can go and read more and I, I really really do appreciate that. <laughs> yes I think it's something that I um, try and do. I'm not it, it's a strange thing because I try and make very clear and my editor used to get on my case about it because I can be quite self-deprecating especially in writing so one of the big notes I always get from my editor is like can you maybe talk with authority rather than speaking down about yourself because I'm not an academic and I have an academic kind of mind I like to think I like to think that I'm academically minded or that I'm on the fringes because I do attend academic conferences and I like to read academic books and essays I, I spend a lot of time on JSTOR basically is what I'm saying and 
because I'm not actually somebody who holds a degree, I often feel like I am lesser because of that, that I need to prove myself even more. Um, but, you know, it was with writing the book, I wanted to present something that was both from the heart, that was both a, a representation of my personal practice, which I don't necessarily believe that a spiritual or magical practice needs to be inherently scholarly in order to be authentic. But at the same time, there is this sense of, you know, there is a pendulum that swings and sometimes it swings a bit too far over here. There is the idea, you know, there is such a thing as being too scholarly to the point where thing like creativity and expression. And then there's being so anti-scholar that we're just off into that woo woo cuckoo land where people shove smoky quartz up their hoo-hahs. So I kind of try and try and keep that balance in the middle. I'm like, I'm very open about the fact that I'm not an academic who has like a degree or anything in this, but that I try and keep a lot of my practices informed and inspired by things that are more rooted in reality as opposed to being up there. So yeah, it's it's about that balance for me. And I try and stick to being able to present things that are more factual rather than just repeating what has been said a million times before um, and was just, you know, never cited as to where that information came from. Yeah. I know it's funny as well because Amaya talked a lot in the last episode about how she roots a lot of her practice in folklore and, and, and so on. And Amaya is a lot like me in the fact that like she loves the historical rabbit holes and what have you. And I know obviously from reading your book that you've obviously clearly done a lot of research into folk practices and so on as well. But then you've obviously adapted them because obviously the contemporary world is different, you know, so you're going to do things differently. So would that have also been the case historically for Welsh practitioners? Would they have just kind of made things up according to need and kind of felt their way through it, as it were? Or would they have had kind of, I'll call them recipes, as it were, that they would have followed, that they may have inherited from someone else or maybe, I don't know, traded with other people. I don't know how they would have got them. Would it have been one or the other or again, somewhere in the middle? The fun thing about magic in general, and I was speaking to, um, there's a lovely gent called Andrew Philip Smith, who's just written a book on fairies as well within a Welsh context. And we were speaking recently about the syncretic nature of magic and how like brilliant that is because like I was just saying there is this pendulum of being like to the point of being overly scholarly to the point of being overly woo and that overly scholarly side is the one that's locked in what my friend Christopher likes to call the realm of logos the, the realm of logic like if something isn't written down if something isn't presented in the context of modern day academia then it's not it's just not authentic at all it can't be authenticated and when you take it too far that way you can get into really like extremes I find to the point where there is no room for growth expansion evolution or expression in that way and um, magic has always been especially from a Welsh context I can't speak elsewhere because I'm very uh, I'm I'm very stereotypical when it comes to I have a special interest and that is what I focus on and mine tends to be Wales so I don't know about other cultures but within Wales you can tell that magic has always been very syncretic in nature meaning that like they have mixed and adapted things with other things they've changed things to fit into the Welsh context that were not originally Welsh they have taken you know small regions rituals that were only applicable to like this place here and they've made it more broad and it's just like that is how the transmission of culture tends to happen in Wales it's that something tiny might happen over here that this guy does and then someone will take it and go I can change that and I can make it better and I love that I love that quality of being able to adapt things for your regionality a really good example is um, there is an old book called uh, it's referred to as Hivar Kavrin uh, which translates to the secret book of the cunning man from Denbyshire. And it's a 19th century manuscript, which is now lost. It was it was known to us in the 80s and I think the 90s. And there was a fabulous academic called Kate Bossa Griffiths who wrote an entire book about it in the Welsh language. And we know it existed because there are photographs of it and there are these academics who talk about it. 
but it went missing at some point, I think in the either 90s or the 2000s. It went completely missing and nobody knows where it is anymore. But this book was really fascinating because it was a essentially a journal that was kept by a cunning man who practiced magic in Denbyshire in North Wales. And he was communing specifically with a Elwir a Tulwith Teg, which translates to the spirits we call the Tulwith Teg, the fairies. And there are these rituals in there that are written in the Welsh language that um, teach you how to summon and call the fairies. And a lot of the methods in that book, you can trace it back to older sources, and they're not necessarily all Welsh. There are elements in that book that um, obviously come from uh, English or German sources that have been changed. So like, there's specifically a, a, an incantation to the seven sisters who are these seven fairy sisters that are supposedly very good allies in helping find lost treasure, according to this book. And these seven sisters have these really um, like specific names. And we can find that list of these seven sisters in other folk magical traditions. But in other cultures, they're usually referred to as demons. They're usually referred to as like specifically seven sister demons. And when they made their way into Wales, they changed it so that it fits with fairy more commonly because that was more of an aspect of our folk belief than demons were. We were more likely to be aware of what a Tulwith tag or the fairies were and so it changed adapted and it syncretized into the culture of wales through that and then it became this specific fairy tradition then and i just love that it means that like the way that we are doing it now as modern magical practitioners where we take what works and that's always my keyword what works and we adapt it until it does work that has always been done by magical practitioners throughout history and we may get um, looked down upon for it now but it's what has always happened throughout all of time and I think that is something that needs to be more apparent within um, Welsh culture today specifically as well because I, I speak a lot to people like Christopher Hughes about how how our stories and our cultures and our traditions are kind of expressed today and how we tend to be kind of obsessed with the written word and with, again, logos, with this idea of the, the like academic way of looking at things. And if something exists... Um, in a specific way, we have to think that that's how it should stay forever and it can't be changed and it can't be adapted and it can't evolve into something new. But the whole point of a lot of these traditions that we had was to evolve, was to change. And the best example we have of that are things like myths and folklore, where we know that the stories of, say, the Mabinogi were changed over time, and they still are to this day in Wales. There are still new adaptations, new retellings being told within Welsh theatre groups, within Welsh storytelling groups. They're still doing that to this day. Folklore is even more obvious because we can find the exact same story that happened on Anglesey that is regionally specific to this one village on Anglesey we can find the exact same story down in Denbyshire but like they've changed some of the characters names to match local like legend legendary figures or they've changed some of the locations so that it's more rooted in that locale rather than up on Anglesey but it's the exact same story um, the best example of that I can find is the story of the giant of the Reekin which is actually from Shropshire which technically now is in England but it's in the Welsh marches so we we like to claim them sometimes. <laughs> there are us. Um, there's a story of a giant called Gwendolap Rakin, who is responsible for the creation of one of the hills of Shropshire, the Rakin, um, because he wanted to destroy the town of Shrewsbury. And he came across a cobbler and he was like, how far is it to Shrewsbury? And the cobbler said, oh, it's ages away. Look at my shoes. They're all worn out because I've walked from Shrewsbury. And the giant went, oh, sod that and dropped the rocks, creating the Rakin. But if you go over to the Hidden Peninsula in Wales, and there's the exact same story, but in that one, the giant wants to destroy Anglesey, and he asks the cobbler how far is Anglesey, and the story is exactly the same. He drops a pile of stones, and that explains why there's a pile of stones in this one area in North Wales. And it's the same story, but it's just changed to be regional. And I think I look at magic that way. Sometimes we take things that were very specific to this, and now 
they become something new that are relevant to us. And the main important part is that it works, that it actually has an effect. And if it doesn't have an effect, then it's kind of useless, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing that as well, that sometimes I think I kind of do this with folklore. I sort of, I forget that people in these different tales and so on, when they're going to see magical practitioners, had this belief that magic actually did something. And yes, well, you kind of forget that it's almost like an operative law, not quite like gravity, but you know what I mean? That it's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the fact that we're focused too much on this, sometimes it doesn't part, I think. And well, I, I, I think that's a tendency folklorists can have, uh, which is not brilliant. Um, <laughs> but, uh, one of the things that I think was really interesting as well um, when I was reading your book was you talk about obviously a lot of like the Welsh deities and so on. And I keep seeing people who when they're writing their one-on-one books and so on and they're talking about like picking a pantheon which is always a bit of a weird idea because there's always been like such slippage between them um to the, I mean, particularly if you look at like say egypt and greece and they've just made new ones by combining them and the romans did the same so does it bother you when people take welsh deities and then put them into just like a celtic pantheon with figures from the other celtic nations or are you just glad people are interested in them it is a double-edged sword because on one hand, I'm just really glad that these these characters and these stories are getting recognition. And I like that, you know, I, I love the idea that somewhere across the Atlantic right now, there is somebody telling the story of Rhiannon and there's a group of people just having shivers up their back and going, oh, I love that all the way across the Atlantic or all the way down in Australia. That like gives me the shivers sometimes that these stories have such an effect that they've traveled the world now. But at the same time, there is this danger in homogenizing the Celtic nations as one group. For me personally in Wales, it's um, it became a bit of a bitter subject for me for a long time because when I spoke to people about the Celts, you know, about Celtic mythology, Celtic this, Celtic that, there was this knowledge that I had especially when I went to university and I started meeting people from further afield um so when I went to university I lived I don't know why I'm I'm assuming my university just assumed that because I'm Welsh I must be an international student so they put me in because I went to a, a, a university in Manchester so they put me in a in a dorm during in my in my halls of residence with only international students. I had no like English, Welsh, Scottish people at all. It was all international students. So I had like um one of my dorm mates was from uh the Netherlands, another one was from New Caledonia, which is all the way down in the Pacific. Um, I had another one who was from Poland. So like we had all these different people who were from different parts of the world. And one thing I realized was that when it comes to the word Celtic, a lot of people are aware that Ireland and sometimes Scotland come under that umbrella, but Wales often doesn't come up. Like they don't, a lot of people didn't even know Wales existed as a country. They thought we were just a county in England and such. And um, I remember getting really sad about that for a long time. And I think when we homogenize the Celtic nations into this one Celtic umbrella, especially when it comes to things like mythology and pantheons now in modern paganism, there is this tendency that the lesser known nations are just going to fade into the background. And I've seen this happen where people will assume that, say, Keritwen is an Irish goddess because they've seen somewhere that she's the Celtic goddess of inspiration. So they'll go, she's Irish then, because Celtic means Irish, doesn't it? It's synonymous with that. And that makes me sad because it's almost like dismissing and erasing our own culture. Um, I, I struggle as well with the word pantheon in general because it's such a strange word to attach to us, especially because and this is where I might kind of get a lot of hate mail to those listening now, please don't hate me. There is no, in my mind, such thing as a Celtic pantheon. There is no one singular Celtic pantheon of Celtic gods. There are the Welsh gods, there are the Irish gods, there are the Cornish gods, if if the Cornish gods, do they have gods? Yeah, they do, don't they? And it's like, we have specifically regional ones, um, but to put them all together and lump them up as just broadly Celtic can be quite problematic, I find, especially because 
when we're talking about Welsh gods, we're not talking about Iron Age gods of the actual prehistoric, you know, Celts, pre-Christian Celts, even not prehistoric, pre-Christian Celts. When we're talking about Welsh gods, we're usually talking about Welsh literary characters that have now ascended to the point of being deified, who, when we look at them, could potentially historically have been based on and be cognate with older Celtic deities that were pre, you know, Christian in nature. But when we do look at lists, like if you opened my book, it's all like Rhiannon and Blodewedd and Branwen and all these. Those are all characters from medieval literature that, in my eyes, have now ascended through the process of things like apotheosis and through the idea of them being so culturally relevant to divine status. So they are gods to us within a modern context, whether they're gods historically is kind of up for debate. And that's the kind of nuance you won't find when you read these kind of homogenized ideas of Celtic pantheons that just kind of splurge them all together as this one fused entity. I, I see it as a form of cultural erasure, if anything. And it's sad because I like to I like to really push the idea that we need to acknowledge that this word Celtic doesn't mean a lot of what we think it means. It's an umbrella term. It's a term that denotes culture and language, not blood or DNA. And it's a term that, you know, is not to be used as if we're talking about one singular culture ever, because it's not. So yeah, it is a complicated one. I am glad they're being spoken about, but I do wish there was a bit more nuance as to who we're speaking about and why, and that there was a bit of a desire, especially within the pagan world, for people to learn about the cultures these gods are from, not just the gods themselves, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the other thing that always strikes me with the, the Celtic deities is often, like as in the ones that, like say, Canunos, we only know about because of the Romans writing them down. Mm -hmm. And obviously, where I am, we I can think of at least two deities who never make it into any books, and that's Coventina and Antinachiticus. And nobody even knows what Antinachiticus was the god of, um, but there's evidence of him on the wall, and he's not Roman. So... The thing that always strikes me is when you've got these gods in, in the Celtic worldview, as far as we know, obviously, thanks, Pliny, um, they are so tied to where they're from. So to then kind of go, oh, this is the, the god of everywhere. It's like, well, that was from the, that, that one was from Gaul. W would they have had that much in common with somebody from, you know, I don't know, like what is now County Waterford? Like, it's probably not. And I think it's a, it's a, you're right. Yeah. People should kind of learn a bit about the context that produced them because that's just as interesting. Yeah, definitely. And the regionality too. I do love how so many of the gods do have this specific regional nature. Like for example, Keridwen, I see her very rooted in that location of Bala there. And I very much kind of, I struggle when people associate Kenny Dwen because she's associated with a lake in her story with just every lake in existence. There is a part of me that goes, mm, I don't know about that. Yeah, it's a complicated one. Uh, I know um, the the other thing I was going to ask you about um, to do was kind of like quite homogenous belief is ever since I think probably the Victorians, there's been this belief of like fairies as being a bit like Tinkerbell and mm -hmm. And, and so on and I know there's obviously various people who do have their own practices involving the good neighbours so would you say based on the Welsh folklore that that's a good idea or is there a way to work with them safely or would they be best left well alone? Ooh, within a magical context working with fairies um, and specifically within a Welsh context it seems to depend who you are who you are as a person, because for the most part, people didn't want anything to bloody do with fairies. They did anything they could in their power to ward them away, essentially. There are so many, like you open these books of folklore that were written in the 19th and 20th centuries, and there are so many recorded little practices that were made to keep them away, that it's quite obvious people didn't really want them around. And if they had to be around, like in the context of household fairies and things like that, then it was all about appeasing them, not working directly with them, but making sure that they were happy, making sure that you pleased them as much as possible. But um, I do also like I, I'm a big I'm a big speaker on this subject because I get a bit annoyed sometimes because, again, that pendulum, it swings too far from one side to the, to the next, where we go then from people knowing this, knowing that fairies within the 
within the mentality of most common people were something that you do not mess with. We then have people who will kind of push the idea that therefore they should never be worked with magically at all. And that kind of goes against the evidence that we have for magical practice in Wales, because there is this uh, idea, this kind of reference in a lot of texts, whether it's via folklore or whether it's via things like court records. We know that magical practitioners were believed to have this relationship with the fairies. And it was a very complex situation where obviously they were a bit more knowledgeable about what fairies were and they knew how to work with them. So for example, in Welsh folklore, if you were being harassed by the fairies, if you, for example, thought that your child had been swapped for a changeling, or if you were just constantly being bombarded with fairies coming into your home constantly and such, the person you would go to for help was your local magical practitioner, and they would know what to do. They had that knowledge of how to deal with the fairies. And then beyond that, there are also magical practitioners. When we look at the historical record, most of them tend to be confidence tricksters, tricksters unfortunately. But when we look at folklore, there is evidence within stories that magical practitioners had this connection with fairies that they were able to commune with them to summon them to ask for their aid to work with them in tandem somehow and they knew the etiquette that was required in order to do that and the little practices that were required to keep them safe in order to do that and um like i was saying that that manuscript from the 19th century of the uh the journal the secret journal that was owned by the cunning man from denbyshire that has rituals in there to summon and work with the fairies and it tells you specifically you know like if you want to call upon the fairies you have to do this and you have to do that and it's very specific about the kind of things you have to do so it showcases the kinds of lengths that people went to in order to be in good relationship with the the fair folk and so it's a complicated area because for the most part i would tell people to steer clear because it is a a rather scary area like fairies are not these twee little light beings who will appear out of nowhere and sprinkle you with glitter they are rather malicious mischievous and at worst deadly so they can do all sorts of terrible things and they seem to have a different understanding of morality and all that to us and most of all, it's just we we don't understand them very much. They're very liminal, unknowable beings. So, like, I always say to people that fairies are beings of pure contradiction, because if you find something in, like, a book of folklore that says fairies are blah, 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 you will find seven other books that contradict that and tell you something completely different. So it's so complicated and they're so unknowable and tenuous in nature that it is something that isn't for the faint of heart and isn't for those who are just dipping their toes into magic. They are, you need to have a basis of how to work magic in general first before you even embark on trying to build a relationship. But there are little things that people can do, like building relationship with the household fairies, for example. That's an easy one. You just leave some nice cream or milk or whiskey out for them, and you make sure that your house is as clean and as warm as you can possibly keep it. Uh, and so little things like that are just ways to keep them happy. So it's, yeah, for the most part, people kept them away. But magical practitioners were a bit of a different story. Mm. It's just suddenly occurred to me that so I know obviously one of the things that comes out in the English witch trial records is about witches having familiars. So did magical practitioners in Wales have that or was it again based more on need? Oh, this is the interesting thing. It's like there are mention of familiar spirits within uh, Welsh law, and sometimes that crosses over into fairy tradition as well. So, for example, there are some stories of cunning men or um, conjurers or just wise people in general who people went to for aid of magical nature that they had familiars but rather than for example in a lot of English kind of lore I think I'm just kind of going off of the very fringe knowledge I know now there is this idea that they take the form of like animals and things like that um, and in Welsh law that didn't really come up as much it was more case of they were these spirits that were either trapped into bottles or trapped into books and I love the book one because it's this whole idea of a spirit literally living in a book and there are these folk tales of these conjurers telling people do not open my book because bad things will happen and then people do open the book because of course they do and these familiar spirits come out of the book 
And the way in which it crosses over with fairy tradition is that there's specifically one story that kind of echoes that, and that is the story of Pukar Truin. So a Pukka is kind of this strange little, usually malicious goblin-like creature, um, kind of a, a middle ground between malicious ghostly spirits and fairies. It's kind of this weird middle creature that kind of exists in the landscape and can sometimes come into your home. So there's this parallel between them and household fairies as well, and they can cause all sorts of havoc. And in the story of Pukar Truin, there is this reference to how this spirit became so accustomed to the people who lived in the house in which it haunted that it became a familiar spirit to them, to the point where the person who owned the house would just ask it questions about things and it would tell it the answers. So because these liminal, like strange goblin and fairy creatures, they have knowledge beyond what we have because they're not restricted by time and corporeality and things like that. So you can ask them questions like, hey, is Nancy down the street sleeping with Dick the milkman or not? And it would know, yeah, and it would tell you. So it became this familiar spirit, but only to those it trusts it only to those it became uh, accustomed to and grew in relationship to and it was still a bit of a dick to those people as well it was still a bit malicious even towards those people that it became a familiar spirit to so yeah there is this kind of interesting role of the familiar spirit but we don't necessarily have a name for it and it might I don't know if it maybe crossed over into Wales in a later date but yeah there is a uh, an idea of people who practice magic having these spirits that they could um, work with that were allies to them in their magic. And it also crossed over with fairy tradition. Cool, cool. Because I think some of the stories you hear about familiars, you just think, first of all, and people believe that, but second of all, you do kind of think, oh, that would be really useful. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Go get me some milk. <laughs> And the thing is, as well, like people always sort of like, oh, I would have this as a familiar, and it'd be something really cool. And I'm like, oh, I bet I'd have something really, really like useless, like a snail or something <laughs> like that. Oh gosh, go get me milk, and just still waiting two weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, obviously we we're talking about the whole, um, I don't want to say Celtic thing, but the 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 homogenization of of the Celtic sort of worldview and so on earlier. And I think obviously because of the time of year that it is, a lot of people kind of it's all like, oh, so and so and so and which is cool and it's really interesting and so on. But you also mentioned Nos Kalangayef earlier. Do you feel that it gets its nose pushed out a little bit in comparison and how different is it? And also how will you be celebrating? I do think that it gets pushed out a little and it's something that I kind of am on a mission lately to try and make people more aware of it, more aware that Noskal Gev just exists in general, you know, because Kalan Gayav was something that I grew up with. It was something that I knew about all my life. It wasn't something that I only learned about when I came into paganism. It was what we called Halloween, you know, people growing up, I was always told Kalan Gayav just means Halloween in Welsh. Mm -hmm. And then as I grew older and I started looking into it, I was like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't though, does it? It doesn't translate to Halloween. It translates to, so Kalan Gayav translates to the, um, the calends of winter so the first days of winter it literally means the beginnings of the winter period and then Norse Kalangayev is the eve of winter essentially it's the the day before winter begins so it usually took place around October 31st and that's where we get that date from now and why it's associated as the Welsh version of Halloween um, and a lot of the traditions tend to correlate with some of the stuff that happens at Halloween if kind of a bit more um, old-fashioned I suppose I could say so like there are a lot of traditions associated with um, so within kind of the folk practice of Norse Galangayev and Kalangayev we have this syncretism again more syncretism <laughs> always syncretized things going on of um, these older kind of folk customs that were associated with the beginnings of winter and then like all Souls Day or All Saints Day where people started revering their dead and such at that time of year. So we have like a tradition called Hell Buid Kenada Meiro, which is like collecting food for the hosts of the dead. And the whole idea of the tradition of Hell Buid Kenada Meiro was that children who were mostly poor children who couldn't afford food would go door to door, knocking on doors and singing. And in time for this 
time of year, it, like just as this time of year approached, people would prepare by baking these cakes that they called solod, which was very similar to soul cakes from other parts. And the solod were like these little cakes and people, the children would come to the door, sing a song, and they would give them the cakes, the solod. And that was the Hellboyd Killer the Maid. And I always say to people, does that not sound very similar to trick or treat? <laughs> like very similar, the idea of children coming to your door, reciting something to you, and you give them some sweet stuff in return. And so you can kind of see almost like how a lot of these traditions seem like um, that the Halloween versions are just like a watered down version of these older uh, more visceral kind of folk customs and such. And I'm always a bit sad because whenever I do mention this, some people tend to get li really iffy with me and they'll say, well, no, because trick or treat and Halloween and all of that kind of Halloween stuff specifically comes from Samhain, not from um, anything Welsh. And I always like to argue with that and go, well, you know, when we always say that Halloween is more of an American thing and the Americans were basically us, weren't they? They they are people who used to be here that moved over there, the white Americans now. They went over there from this part of the world. So is it really that unlikely that perhaps the modern day Halloween is less of a just purely soured and maybe it's soured with a little bit of Kalangayav here because there were some Welsh Americans who added some influence as well and maybe with elements of culture role practices that were done in Scotland or Cornwall or maybe even parts of England and they fused together to create the modern image of Halloween um so yeah that's one area that I like to get on my high horse about and go you know maybe Kalagayev needs some recognition as well but where I get kind of annoyed is when people just assume that Samhain is just a pan-Celtic word that was used in all the Celtic nations. So I see a lot of the memes and stuff going around at this time of year, which are like Samhain, the Celtic word for the beginning of winter or summer's end. And this is how it's pronounced in Wales. And I was looking at it and go, we don't have that word in Welsh. We don't have Samhain. And it definitely wouldn't be pronounced Samhain in Wales because it's uh, Welsh is a phonetic language. So if it was spelt like we spell Samhain now, then it would be pronounced Samhain not to Samhain. Um, so I get kind of annoyed at things like that. But Kalangayev and Norse Kalangayev in general, to me nowadays, um, I like to take inspiration from traditions of the past. So we know that it was a time of a little bit of frivolity, a little bit of partying, a little bit of divination being carried out in various games, folk customs and such. It was a time to light bonfires and to have a bit of fun as the colder, darker, bleaker days of winter are ahead. You know, look forward to it by having a bit of a party. And then also coming together with your family or your community to have food and drink and party and to have games and such. But it was also as um, the festivities of Norse Kalangayev went over to Kalangayev, it was then a time of a little bit of solemnity as well towards the dead. So it was a time to honour the dead in that uh, in that sense as well. So I kind of like to mix these two, as well as the ghostly and more spooky traditions as well, because those are part of it as well. And I like to fuse it all together to create a practice that is purely my own and modern, but inspired and informed by the past. So the types of things I do on Noskal and Gav is like, I will usually, so I have a little coven nowadays, so I usually practice with them. And we will make a big feast. We'll have a feast in in this place. Literally, I'm sat at my dining table right now. We will sit here having a big feast. And part of that feast is that each one of us um, will have a little space dedicated next to our plate where we'll set up a little plate for our recently deceased. And we'll put maybe sometimes a little name plaque, plaque next to the food so that we know this is food for that person who has passed over will speak their name will tell stories about them because we have the belief that what is remembered lives so we know that so long as we tell their stories so long as we acknowledge the aspects of them that are still apparent within us and so long as we know their influence on the world is still here then they are still alive essentially they are still inspirited and part of this world and we bring them and breathe them into life via their stories 
uh, on this night and we pour them a drink, we leave them an offering, we have a few invocations and such we say to them. We practice a lot of divination then. I like to cook more traditional Welsh foods. So like there's a traditional food that was called stump nauriw. I call it stunch nauriw because we say stunch up where I'm from. Um, and it's just a kind of mashed vegetables made with nine different ingredients. And it was usually eaten at this time of year. Or sometimes I'll make a cowl, which is like a stew. And um, yeah, we'll serve those kinds of foods. We'll play with our tarot cards and our crystal balls and our tea leaves and all this. Sometimes we'll do some of the older, uh, more traditional forms of divination, like the apple peel divination or with nuts and seeds and such. Um, and then on the 1st of October, to me, that is a day of honouring the dead fully. So I often go back to the village where I'm from, Aberfrau, and I will go and I'll wash the graves of my grandparents who are dead and I'll leave flowers at their graves and I'll make sure that they are tended to on that day. So, yeah, it, it's kind of become this really important part of my life where I see this time of year as both a time of fun as we look forward to the bleaker, darker time of the year, because it can get a bit, you know, sad, can't it, as we get to the colder part, um, especially if you're not a fan of Christmas. <laughs> it could definitely be something that um, you don't want to look forward to. So this is the time to have a bit of a blast before that comes ahead. But it's also a time to honour those who came before us and such. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's so nice that you've got that sort of practice of of tending graves because I know I think it was, oh, I think it was the first year we were allowed out after lockdown, and um, and I went to it's one of the cemeteries in town, which is beautiful, you know, like it's 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 kind of like the the Newcastle version of Highgate, and one of my ancestors is in there, but because obviously we didn't have a huge amount of money. We don't know roughly. Well, I know roughly where she is, but she hasn't got a headstone because we weren't wealthy enough for one of those. Um, so I just like to pop along and fill her in on all the news, um, which probably would baffle the hell out of her if she knew what I was saying. Um, what is this social media you're speaking of? <laughs> but um, but yeah, I th I I just think it's the best time. I don't know if you can hear in the background or not, but some Egypt outside is setting off fireworks because everyone wants to celebrate the twenty sixth of October. Oh, <laughs> so it's kind of annoying, but anyway. I think that's one of the things in England that I can sort of think of. I feel like in some places, bonfire night took over and Halloween was something that you did at primary school. And then you went to fireworks displays for bonfire night, which always seems like a really bizarre thing to celebrate anyway. And I'm like, Halloween's better. Yeah, I, I've noticed that lately, that a lot of the traditions, like when I read the older books that kind of tell you what people did at like Norse Kalangeyav and such, I sometimes read them and I'm like, this sounds like bonfire night, because <laughs> there was this whole tradition in Wales of making these really big bonfires to the point where the books will say like, in some regions of Wales, you could look out towards the hills and you'd see like seven or eight bonfires going off at the same time. And the local boys, you know, the farmers or uh, the farmer's sons would have competitions of who could build the biggest bonfire that night. And they'd roast things like nuts and um, potatoes for some reason and apples on the bonfire and you know it reminds me of how we make toffee apples and stuff nowadays we have a big bonfire and we watch fireworks for Guy Fawkes night so it makes you realize that those practices that we do on bonfire night probably predate the idea of Guy Fawkes by quite a bit and they just kind of moved the dates slightly mm, yeah I know we've got one I think it's, 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 it's a bit more widespread but I know it was definitely there was quite a lot of it in Northumberland of nutcrack night where people and it was you know that love divination where you put nuts in the fire and sort of see if they explode or not, yes. and there's like always a part of me because I love the whole love divination thing and I'm always like oh I'm just going to try all of them for science but I'm like oh I don't know that's the kind of thing I imagine I'll probably end up setting fire to something <laughs> having like flaming nuts flying around the house I don't think that's necessarily <laughs> uh, yeah you never know um anyway so obviously as I say I've really enjoyed. Um, your first book and I know you're working on I feel like you've written lots but I don't know if they've all come yes. out oh gosh um, it, it's a strange one I was talking to my friend about this recently how um, at the minute it's almost been two years since Welsh Witchcraft came out it'll be two years in February next year um, so it's almost two years since Welsh Witchcraft came out and in that period I've it looks like on the outside I've done nothing because nothing has come out but I've been working in the background and doing a lot so I've actually got 
three books that are in the process of being published right now. Um, but they will all come out and it'll feel like they'll all just come out at once because one of them is due out in autumn 2024. The next one after that is due in January 2025. And then the next one after that is like March 2025. So it'll feel like it's just like bang, bang, bang all at once. But the next one, I'm really excited for it because it's, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to anyway, because what they're going to do, what are they going to do? Shoot me? <laughs> but uh, my next one is all about fairies and till with tag and such so it's all about the fairy traditions of wales and it's a it's rather different to welsh witchcraft because i as i said earlier welsh witchcraft was kind of a blend of taking inspiration and information from these past traditions but it being rooted in more modernity it was like it's my practice and it's the way that i've been taught to practice it's the way that i do my stuff now there's already stuff in welsh witchcraft i look at and i think oh i would have done that differently now um but you know that book was essentially a personal look at Welsh witchcraft via the history and myth and law of Wales. So it's how I've taken inspiration from those various sources and created my own path right now. Whereas this next book, which is all about fairies, it is less of a personal exploration of fairies and more of really a guide to the folklore surrounding fairies in Wales and who they are. Like, where, why do we call them Tolwith Teg? And is there any other alternate names? And I look at things like, um, so for example, we always hear that Gwynapnith is the king of fairies. And I look into where does that come from? And is it true? Like, is he actually a king of fairies within Welsh law? Or is that something that just became a thing in the Victorian era? And so, yeah, there's a lot of these kind of little things that I've looked into in more depth um it's i wouldn't i would hesitate to say it's more scholarly because i'm not a scholar but it's definitely one that i put a lot more effort into and spoke to a lot of experts on so for example i went to see lisa tallis down at the national library um, of wales uh not the national library oh i'm lying there at the library at the university of wales down in cardiff um at the special collections vault where she probably lives i don't think she leaves that place um i went and spoke to her i've spoken to a few other people who are doing their phds in vanguard and such so though i'm not an academic i have used my academic connections a lot with this one um and i've tried to make it as accessible yet informative as possible because i feel like if there's one area that gets misunderstood a lot within welsh law it is fairies it's very much fairies uh, and so this book hopefully will provide that but because i'm a witch and because of the publisher i write i write for it is also a guide for how to connect to fairies so it's both a, a kind of look at the the area of folklore that surrounds fairies and also a look at how that can inspire and inform your practice. But yeah, it's, it's a complicated book and I can't wait for it to be out because, oh my God, has it been tiring to write? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like it'll be a really good one though. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> clearly I'll, I'll be on the pre-order list for that one. Um, Thank you so much for your time as well. You've been very generous with um sharing lots of, of information. Where can people find you online? And that always sounds really weird. Like, like they're gonna stalk you or something but like where can people find you online oh gosh i might enjoy a good stalk every now and then um i'm i like to say that i'm a bit like a rash so once you've brushed up against me i kind of pop up everywhere so on social medias i'm under mara starling everywhere so m-h-a-r-a underscore starling usually uh be careful of all those fake accounts pretending to be me they're not me i do not do readings online but i am on instagram i am on youtube i am on tiktok um and i kind of have different personalities on every single bloody social media platform on tiktok i jump around dancing on stones telling stories about whales uh, on like youtube i sit and i i do very kind of like fun videos about certain things like whether or not corgis are actually ridden by fairies in welsh folklore um so yeah you can find me pretty much everywhere i also have a patreon if anybody wants to support me on there where i'm currently running a little learn welsh course and i also have um my podcast the welsh witch podcast and of course my books so yeah keep an eye out for me <laughs> Lots of places for people to to encounter your work, which is excellent. <laughs> um, but yeah, I also like the fact that I've essentially managed to hit kind of England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland with this <laughs> with this particular <laughs> little series, which is nice. 
thank but you. thank you so much for your time. It really has been a lot of fun talking to you. And I hope I hope people come and find your work as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.